All right, we're recording. All right, well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Ball Watching. We have a very, very special interview for you all today. We are joined by John Mozeliak, the current president of baseball operations for the St. Louis Cardinals, a 26-year veteran of the Cardinals front office and a multiple executive of the year award winner uh, and really just fostering a culture of winning and success as part of the Cardinals organization show. Uh, Mo, we're going to call you. That is your preferred nickname. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. Looking forward to it. We got a, a loaded agenda for you today. We got to take advantage of this time that we have with you and such a big voice in our community here in St. Louis. But uh, so, Mo, we're, we're really a, at a podcast oriented and focused on St. Louis City SC, the new MLS club arriving at uh, the new professional franchise. But we also want to highlight a lot of the cool people and figures that, you know, have big voices in our community, especially in the sports scene, uh, and that are just so heavily involved because the club is one of those two, or, you know, a lot of what you see they're doing is trying to, you know, improve on St. Louis and, uh, and, and affect those around them and not just the sporting scene. So uh, it's important for us to have people like you on and, and get to hear your perspective as well and what you've contributed here. So First, we're kind of going to get to know you a little bit and have the listeners get to know who Mo is and then get into some of your role uh, with the Cardinals. Talk about a couple fun things as well and then kind of wrap it all in with St. Louis City uh, at the end here. So for the first question we've got for you, Mo, um, we did some research before here and, and I read that you were, uh, were brought up and, and raised in, in Boulder, Colorado. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Tell us about Boulder. I've driven through it before, but I don't know much about Boulder. Yeah, it was an amazing place to grow up, uh, you know when you think about like kind of like what we're dealing with here in St. Louis, when you think about like the safety of the city and, and what goes on my time in Boulder, I believe from roughly 1976 to basically 90 when I left, I think there was one murder. Um, so it was just a really like kind of like safe family yeah. environment. Um, you know, I was, I was fortunate. I lived at the base of the foothills and it was uh, just a really cool place to grow up. So uh, my father had worked for IBM. So we were out there and, you know, when I think back to my time, it was certainly special, but as you pointed out, I'm actually beginning my 28th year with the St. Louis Cardinals. Oh my God. So, um, you know, I, I consider St. Louis my home, both my kids yeah. were born here. And uh, you, you know, when you think about majority of where you've spent your life, it has uh, definitely been in St. Louis. Wow, it's incredible. So you talk about Boulder, a little bit better of a murder rate, definitely compared to here in St. Louis. But is there a baseball, you know, haven in Boulder? Is it a big baseball town? How did you get into baseball or even thinking about baseball? You know, not really. I, I uh, grew up playing it. Um, I never had any aspirations to to do what I'm doing or even work in professional sports. Um, it was sort of by happen chance because uh, back in 1993, when the Colorado Rockies came into um, existence. They were an expansion team. I had a friend who actually got a job with, with the Rockies and um, he actually needed some help. I had a computer background and so I helped him, you know, create some databases and, and really uh, just get him going. And then ultimately I was offered a job. And so that's how it all started. And then um Obviously, I got to meet some people when I was there. And then ultimately, Walt Jockety, who was the assistant GM for the Rockies at the time, um, when he became the general manager of the Cardinals, he uh, he brought me with him. And so I that's really how I began my career here in St. Louis. And it was an entry level job in the scouting department. And, uh, you know, it was a unique opportunity and one that I never saw coming. But um, fortunately, made the most of it. And in a lot of ways, the rest was history. Oh, my God. So how, how long were you at the Rockies then before you came over to the Cardinals? Three years. And, Three years. Um, yeah, and if you go back to 94, that was the strike year. So we lost the last six, seven weeks of that season. And then, uh, obviously, uh, the 95 year w was, was delayed, but they ended up getting a full season in. It's incredible. And I think one of the, the main things, if you go all the way back, uh, you were also able to kind of be a part of the crew and overseeing the the drafting of two of the best Cardinals of all time with Pujols and Yadier Molina. What was some insights back in the day on when they were younger guys? I know everybody's got to see them throughout their career and starting to come to an end now. But what was what is something that kind of stuck out to you back then? Yeah, I think one of my favorite stories, starting with Albert, was he was playing in that NBC tournament, which is in Wichita. And 
I went with a couple of their scouts to go see him because the, the, the summer was coming to an end. He was going to have to make a decision to either sign or go back to school. And, and so went to watch him play. They were playing at University of Wichita, which was an AstroTurf um, infield. So balls moved kind of quick. He was playing third, and I, I was sort of like, uh-oh. You know, not much defensive skills. But then, you know, when he took batting <laughs> practice, you know, made a lot of noise there. And uh, next day, I remember flying to Little Rock. I met up with Mike Jorgensen, who was our farm director. And he's like, what you, would you think? I go, you know, really exciting bat. You know, might have to make him a catcher. And uh, <laughs> now, now fast forward like about six weeks, we did sign him. And we were in an, what's referred to as instructional league, which is basically like a practice league in the fall time for newly signed players or first year players. And so we were down there. His first at bat hits a ground ball up the middle. Second at bat, he hits a home run that went four miles. And then Jordy <laughs> looks at me and he says, he'll be just fine at third. And uh, <laughs> he was right. And, and then, you know, jump ahead now to the next draft. We had, uh, we drafted Yachty. And Yachty was, you know, top five round pick. So, like, you know, that's pretty high up there. And anyway, I, uh, one of our scouts by the name of Steve Turco, I sent to go see him because he was playing like an American Legion or Connie Mack tournament in Florida prior to deciding whether to go to school or not. And um, I called him up and I'm like, hey, what do we give him? And he's like, whatever he wants. That's pretty good advice. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. Yeah, you know, it is pretty good advice. I think that that paid off over time. It, it was sure incredible. Did. Just slightly. What an incredible year last year being a part of that journey with those two back together again. It was so rewarding. I mean, because Justin and I grew up, I mean, we were kids at the time, but we we everyone had a Yachty jersey. Everyone had a Pujols jersey. It was how we remember Cardinals baseball. Like our first memories are all the way back then. Um, I mean, so thank you for doing that, Mo. That was incredible. <laughs> I, I thank you on behalf of St. Louis. I hope you've heard that from, from more folks. But okay, so Mo, you're, you're rising the ranks here at the Cardinals. Did you ever, I mean, because being a pretty young, I feel like executive in the front office, did you ever get any sort of age bias or people kind of looking over your shoulder? You know, what is he doing? I mean, how is he so young in these roles? Did that ever happen to you? I, I really, like when I, when I first started, I definitely noticed that I was in, in positions that most people were not my age. And um, I always sort of refer to myself as an old soul, meaning like, I feel like I relate to older people anyway. Um, like I just get along with them. So I think like from that standpoint, it always sort of helped me fit in, but yeah, I mean, at 28, I was named scouting director. Um, you know, at 38, I was general manager and, and now I am where I am today, but you know, I still find like some of my closest friends happen to be like five or 10 years older than me now. So that's just who I relate to, but yeah. look, that demographic's changing for me. Right. Because, you know, as I'm starting aging out in the business, this is becoming a much younger man's game. And so I have to adapt and adjust to the, the younger generation that's coming and working for, for this organization or for sports in general. So I think like the key to success in any type of leadership role is the ability to adapt and adjust. Yeah, I think you're doing a pretty good job of it. Thinking back and probably circling it back to the last time we made the run at the World Series back in 2011. I know you already shared a couple of stories with Yachty and Pools. What are some other stories that you had from that year in the World Series and what kind of stuck out to you, obviously, besides going the whole way with the team? Well, I think like anytime you really have like deep runs in October or ultimately the success of, of raising a trophy, I, you know, I think back to like 2004, which was probably like the best team that I was ever a part of. Um, when you think back to that everyday lineup, you had now Hall of Famer Scott Rowland. You yep. have, you're going to have eventually the Hall of Famer, Albert Pujols, and then you had Jim Edmonds. And if you look back at it, all three of those guys had OPSs of over 1,000. And you know, that's a pretty impactful offensive yeah. team, plus the surrounding cast was amazing. And, and you also had guys like Chris Carpenter that were just dominating. And, you know, but unfortunately, and this is the point of the story, is, is October is about are you clicking on all cylinders? Because if you're not – you're not going to end up raising that trophy. And, and in 04, you know, even though we were an amazing team, we weren't able to do it. And, and so we came up um, obviously short, got swept by Boston, which was completely you yep. know, disappointing. And then jump ahead to uh, 2006 when, you know, we're kind of limping through the year. I mean, we're basically a 500 club, never really got healthy. Then that last week of the season, we get guys like Jim Edmonds back. All of a sudden we have this bounce in our step of health. 
And, you know, fortunately for us, we got hot at the right time and we were able to make that run. And, and you know, I think the, the Mets Cardinal series was one of those that will, you know, be in, in a lot of our memories for, for the rest of our life. And then, you know, the same thing could be said in, in 2011. You know, it was a, a, a club that, you know, certainly had its ups and downs and challenges yeah. throughout the year. But, you know, when, when you think back to that postseason run, you know, David Freeze might have had the most impactful 30 days of, of someone's career. And to right. do it in the postseason is really amazing. And I think a lot of people overlook how good Albert was in, in that that month as well. And so when you have those kind of guys just clicking, it works. And, you know, I even think back to 2013 where I thought that team was, you know, really good as well. And, um, you know, unfortunately we came up short against Boston as well. And in that one, so that was, that was frustrating, but, you know, when people complain about whether you get to October and what you do in October, you got to realize October success is about timing. I mean, even think back to this past year, and, you know, we're up in game one, all of a sudden, you know, we can't close out the game, right. we give it up. And all of a sudden, Philly gains, you know, a breath of, of, of air maybe they didn't see coming. And then look at the run they went on. And Unbelievable. You know, it would have been interesting to see what would have happened had we won that game. Right. right. And, you know, who knows what the outcome of that series would have been. But, you know, I, I do think it's it is about momentum. It is about timing. And, uh, you know, I think what we try to do here is, is make sure we get to October because then you have that at least that roll of the dice or that chance to win in October. I love that mentality and, and that commentary you have on just reflecting back on some of those memories. And one thing that I kind of have a question on Mo, just in terms of myself, and I feel like just for any regular fan, is on your current role. So right now you're the president of baseball operations at the Cardinals. In layman's terms, or you know, in the elevator pitch, how can you define that role to someone that may not be as into the front office as in, in baseball like you are? Yeah. So basically, my role is I oversee everything that's baseball related. So. Maybe the easiest way to think about it is imagine a table and we have four legs of a table and we'll, we'll define those legs as like scouting, player development, analytics. And then why don't we just throw like one of the legs as medical and performance. Okay. And so my responsibility is making sure those four legs are sturdy, stable, because if they're not, what happens to the table? It wobbles, yep. right? right? So my energy is really spent on those four legs. Most people think all I care about is like what happens on the field or, or you, you know, the major league club. Right. And I do care. Don't get me wrong. I mean, that's certainly a, a focus. But you, you can't be good at the major league level if you don't have a good foundation. So when people ask me what I do, I oversee baseball ops for the St. Louis Cardinals. And that is ultimately about – creating a pipeline, whether that's the talent on the field or talent in your front office or talent on the coaching staff. Um, so the ability to have employees, players understand that if they do well, there's opportunity to grow. And um, I think, you know, as, as, as someone that's been able to grow throughout my career, I know that's something that people appreciate. And, you know, I know players want, the ability to get to the big leagues and they'd like to do it here versus somewhere else. Ultimately their goal is to get to the big league. So, you know, we try not to block them by just making player acquisition after player acquisition. We believe in our pipeline. We've had a lot of success in the draft and in development. And, you know, ultimately that allows that table to be strong. And you, and you mentioned that pipeline, I think going back to the farm system, we've always had one of the stronger farm systems in the MLB. I know looking at some exciting guys coming up, Jordan Walker, Mason Wynn, just to name a few, what sets us apart? How do we always consistently have these guys coming through the pipeline that we are able to use either as options for possible trade pieces or obviously bringing up and then working their way up and being a big leaguer in St. Louis? Yeah, great question. Um, can't give you the real answer, so I'll give you a different version. <laughs> but I, I mean, I really do feel like we, we, we do believe in our scouting department we give them the ability to, to really be a part of that decision tree. And so, you know, I think a lot of places they talk about scouting. Um, sometimes I think it, it can be a bit of a like lip service, whereas for us, it, they really are critical component on how we think about our decision making. And so, you know, if you don't have guys identifying talent and identifying players, it's not so much what they see that moment, but what they see in the future on a player that they have the belief in those players that they can grow 
and ascend, obviously, to the major league level. And I think, you know, you, you have to then dovetail that right into how you think about player development or, or building that curriculum. Because it's, it's one thing to say, okay, we've got great coaches, but it's mostly important if the coaches can reach the players. Just imagine your time back in school. There's probably a teacher that you think back or a professor that you think back to that really had an impact in your life for, for a variety of reasons. But A, it made you smarter. It gave you confidence and it allowed you to grow into whatever you wanted to do. And so, you know, that's really how we think about our, our development. And so the draft under Randy Flores, he does an amazing job. The player development side under Gary LaRock, who you know, has years of experience in this side of the business, they really do just, they, they, they make the circle whole. And, and that allows us to really be, you know, truly more competitive when you think about, you know, we're the 26 size market in baseball but yet we're able to compete at a much higher level because we focus so much on that pipeline and making sure we get it right. Love that. And, and Mo, and kind of getting into, you know, we're obviously we all love sports. We all love, you know, I mean, at least I'm on social media and, and looking at comments there. And I know you probably more than anyone else are very familiar with what's going on there, or maybe not, but, you know, Mo, tell us about, you know, obviously Cardinals nation is a very, expecting, you know, high expectation type fan base, you know, and we've been blessed with so much winning in our lives. I mean, Justin and I don't know much else other than us winning uh, for the Cardinals in our lifetime. And it hasn't always been like that, but it has at least recently. And I want to ask you, you know, when you are going through rough patches or when you do get, you know, dissent or negativity from, from fans or really anyone, how do you personally kind of deal with that? Yeah. So it's sort of interesting, right? Because you think about my career and, and sort of, my time like being responsible for ultimately this side of the business it's it's been a lot of the evolution on social media was sort of running parallel to that right i mean if you think back like when i first got into baseball there was no twitter there was no right. instagram snapchat or whatever people use but let's just focus right now like on something like twitter for example like you know early on and, and i was one of the you know early market movers on that got it because it was like you know quick information um, I never actually had an account where I would like send out tweets, but I would just use it to sort of like stay on top of yeah. current events, what was happening in the industry, that type of thing. But then, you know, as I was, uh, you, you know, using it more, looking at it more, it, it became a little bit addicting. But then when things weren't going well, it became kind of like, you know, crush your ego, make you feel bad, second guess yourself. And like, so when people talk about like sort of like, you know, your mental health with these these tools or social media um, platforms, it, it is true. I mean, like I was kind of feeling dark at one point, you know, a few years ago, I just finally said I got to delete it. You know, I took it off my phone, took it off my computer, quit looking at it because um, it really was just putting me like in a bad spot. And when when your club's not playing well, obviously we take it personally right? We care. We, we, we like winning. We, we like to have success. And yes, I understand. We, we also are like, get to know players really well, right? Like, so like when they're struggling, you know, we feel bad for them too. So there's like these relationships that are getting tested, but then the public side of things can be really rough. Now I will say like when I'm out and about in St. Louis, I mean, most fans are amazing. They're, they're super polite. They're super complimentary. They, you know, they, they, they always make you feel pretty good. But there are times when someone comes up and, you know, says something that you're like, I can't believe that man just said that. But you know, <laughs> it, it does happen. But, you know, net net, I think our fan base is, is amazing. But I do think in the in the social media world, anybody can say anything. Yep. And I think you both would agree. People do say anything. And yep. so oh, careful what you listen to. It's it's tough, especially the way that we went down this year. I think it, there was a lot of negativity uh, on Twitter and other social media. So I I couldn't believe having to perform at that high of a level and then do well for so long for so long of the year, and then just have these guys just berate you for the one game that happens at the end. So yeah, a couple of thoughts on that real quick. Well, first off, mem <laughs> mem mem memories are short, right? Like like, right. like people Amnesia. really people yeah. don't really care about like tenure length and all that. All they really care about is what happened to that. And then the other thing I'd always, I always tell people, it's like success is fleeting. I think back to like 2011 and, and we win the world series and, you know, Bill and I are our owner. We're, we're sitting upstairs in like this uh, kind of like private room. And, you know, we're both trying to like, just like 
enjoy this moment, like just kind of embrace just what happened. And, but right away, your mind just starts moving. I knew the next day Tony LaRusso was going to, going to step down and retire. I knew within the next couple of weeks we were going to be negotiating the biggest contract in this franchise history with Albert Poole. And so like the, the, the success that you worked your entire life for and you're sitting there trying to enjoy it is just so fleeting. So I think really what I'm trying to tell you guys is it's really about sort of the journey to get there because the moment you get there, it kind of goes quick. And so um, yeah. it's a lot like what fans experience. What's next and how are you going to get it done? I'll kind of loop that in too, Jake. I don't know. So the SLU men's basketball team, their, uh, their slogan um, for Forrester and Son, uh, they, it is the journey is the reward. And I think it's really taking a step back. And as you're understanding that you're going through this whole season to reach a goal, but don't let that just fly by. Take the time to take a breather, look around, understand and be thankful for kind of what you're working through. And I think, like you said, it's a long season. So right when you win, I know it's probably um, addicting to be like, we got to do it again. What's the next steps, but definitely taking a step back and enjoying it, not only in sports, but in life. I think that's great advice. Yeah, I, I wish I had listened to myself back at eleven. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, Mo, no, you've done you've done a, a a bunch of things right on the line, and then everyone can kind of get behind that because one of the things that I hear a lot about, and I'm sure fans a lot about, it, is is the culture of the organization and, and how strong and positive it is, and the players love playing in St. Louis. They just love it here. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the the pillars or some of the things that are important that you've set up as part of the culture in the organization? Yeah, I think like like one of the things like. I always think about, and if I said to you both, like, you know, think about the word leadership and how would you guys define it? And I'm not going to put you on the spot in that at the moment, <laughs> but like, you. as you can imagine, there's, there's lots of different words you're, you're all trying to think through and, 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 and use. But for me, you know, I kind of boil it down to, to really just four words, trust, transparency, empathy, and competence. And why those four, you may ask. And, the, and trust is players want to believe in you. Your employees want to believe in you. And, and they want to understand what you're doing and how you do it. Transparency is letting them know why you're doing it, right? Like, like no one ever wants to know where they don't stand in a company, whether you're a player or an employee. So that is like vitally important. And I think of like empathy is like one of those words that no one really like appreciates in the business world but you know for me like having the ability to know where i started and to know where i am i got to see a lot of things along the way and so i certainly appreciate where people are and try to meet them where they're at and the competency part of this is you still have to have skills in this game right um and and so you have to be good at what you're doing whether it's a player or working in the front office so if you think about those four core values those are critical to creating a really good, strong culture. And I think like most people that would tell you, especially players that play here, they feel that. They know where they stand. They know where they're going. If they're pointing up, they don't ask a lot of questions. If they're pointing down, what do I need to do to fix myself and get going again? And, uh, you know, we try to make sure we communicate that on a very regular basis. It's working. I feel like it's working, at least from the outside looking in. I would agree. I was going to say you kind of when you add that in with the pillars kind of explains and it gives a lot of background as to why you've been so successful at the job. So those are those are the more tactical questions. Now we're going to move a little bit into some more fun questions and then kind of round it out with some city questions as well. If that's all right with you. Mo. Yeah. So I would say and this is probably very generic in general, but out of the things that are all upcoming with this season, either new players, new signings, filling holes, what are you most excited about with this team? Yeah, so what I'm most excited about to see is when you think about this club, right, you, you, you could say, well, you didn't really do a whole lot this offseason. You, know? <laughs> you signed a catcher. But there was a reason for that. And, and part of that is when you look at the everyday roster, and you can throw pitchers into this as well, this season's really going to be defined on three things. One is the ability to create opportunity for these players, right? Nobody's getting blocked. It's their job. For them to earn it and if they do things are going to be successful and why do we do that because we have a lot of belief and trust in these guys right so going back to what we were talking about earlier this is what we're doing with these younger players so we believe we have talent on this roster now i couldn't tell you our lineup today 
in terms of writing it in ink. I could write one in pencil, but jobs are going to be competitive this camp. Obviously, Goldie's going to be our first baseman. Nolan Arenado's going to be our third yeah. baseman. People are going to have to compete and earn something. And, you know, you touched on a name earlier, like a Jordan Walker. Here's a young man that, that's accomplished a lot at a very early age. Um, he's going to be banging on the door to get to the big league. And so, you know, how are our current outfield class going to react? How are they going to play? And so this spring is going to be a lot of different things we're going to be watching, a lot of different nuances on how things go. Um, slight distraction, too, with the WBC in, in the sense that we're not going to all be in this camp at one time. So that's going to be something that's going to be a little bit tougher to navigate. But this season, if we if we chose right in the sense of creating this opportunity and having the belief in these players, it's going to be a very successful year. Love it. Love it. Mo, uh, another thing that at least can be new for fans this year is our play-by-play in, in Chip Carey. What excites you most about Chip, or do, what's your relationship with Chip going into the season? Yeah, obviously uh, Chip is someone I've met along the my, my time in the at the big league level. Um, I remember him back when he was with uh, the Cubs, and obviously uh, we crossed paths when he was in Atlanta. So, you know, obviously um, first my, you know, very sad what, what happened with Danny, Danny Mack and, you know, mm-hmm. still someone I, I talk with and, uh, you know, pulling for him. Hope he gets Absolutely. this right. And, uh, you know, I, I do believe there could be redemption there. And then, you know, in, in Chip's case, I think it's, it's a place he wanted to be, right? I mean, obviously he had a pretty good seat in Atlanta, but when he looks at, at what his family meant to the city of St. Louis, he grew up here. Um, you can ask him when you meet him where he went to high school and he'll actually have an answer. And so, you know, I, I think he's just someone that embraces the city of St. Louis, the Midwest. And, uh, you know, obviously when you have to make a change like this, it's always uh, disappointing. But I, I think in the end, we, we ended up on our feet. I love it. I think one thing that I've been admit, this is probably more of a personal question, but are we going to see Pujols and Yachty around in the, in the locker room? Are they going to be helping out at all? Or are they going south for a year and taking, taking some much needed time off? Or have you guys discussed anything with them? Okay. So how do I answer this? Like, this, like first off, Albert has the, uh, the, the personal agreement contract with, with Anaheim. So mm, they, they yep. sort of need to navigate that. Or, right. or, but I, I, my understanding is he's going to honor that. Does that mean he can still have access to come around here? I think the answer would be yes, but not in a like quote, you know, full time role. Correct. Yep. 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 But you know, the door will be open. Um, and then Yachty, you know, he managed this past off season in, in Venezuela. So yep. at some point, he probably should take a break and, and catch his breath. But I would imagine at some point we'll see him, whether it's in Jupiter or, or here in St. Louis, at some point this season. So. Door will always be open for those guys. I think one of the things that the Cardinals do really well is we we stay connected with our alumni. And uh, Joe Pfeiffer and his crew, they just do an awesome job over on the, on the uh, marketing side of, of keeping these guys engaged, creating speaking opportunities for them. And, uh, you know, obviously when you have two iconic players like Albert and Yachty, uh, the door might be slightly wider in terms of being open. So, yeah, I definitely think uh, – at some point we'll see them more awesome that's good to hear mo another question i mean you've been in baseball for your whole life now you know from your professional life but you know it happened so organically it wasn't ever something you planned on doing is there any alternative version of yourself mo that you see what would you be doing if you hadn't gotten into baseball and start with the Rockies so early on you know that's an interesting question and one i don't (laughs) know the answer to because it never happened right but like look when i was younger i had like hobbies like everybody else I, I love to go fly fishing i mean there were times where i i thought oh i could just be a guide um now this goes back 30 years but you know like in in terms of of like my generation of of, of kids like you know your parents basically said look you go to college you get a job that's what you're supposed to do and um you know that's sort of how i thought about life i just happened to enter baseball when i was uh entering the job market yeah. and so here i am that's worked out it's worked out for you <laughs> and i think one, one thing outside of baseball as well we know you're uh big into philanthropy as well working with um the national trustee as the foundation for fighting blindness 
doing the American uh, Parks and Disease Association and sit on the board of, of Mercy. So how do you how do you find time to also do all of this and still help run the Cardinals organization? Well, I think having like, you know, some connection to your community is important. Um, the Foundation Finding Blindness is uh, actually a kind of a unique story because uh, a friend of mine, but at the time I didn't know him, his, his name is uh, Jason Morris. He had written me a letter. As you guys can imagine, you know, I'm a year into being a general manager and you get lots of letters, good, bad, and different. I um, happened to read his and uh, it was about his son who was afflicted with uh, um, losing his sight, going blind. And so uh, he asked to meet, we met, and over lunch he explained the story and his story was um, quite moving. He said, you know, his young son was, I think in first grade or kindergarten and they were um, painting a boat with glow-in-the-dark paint. They painted it. They went into the bathroom to go look at it, you know, turned off all the lights. And he's like, isn't this cool? And his son couldn't see it. And that's when he realized there was a problem. And so obviously he, he took him to, to a doctor. They determined that, that he had a genetic um, disease in his eyes, which would ultimately affect him. And so when we first met, um, that's how I got engaged in this. And, you know, I'm happy to say the young man, you know, his vision is, is worsening as, as he's gotten older, but he's a sophomore at Brown. He's doing well and, uh, you know, super happy for his success. And, and so, you know, Jason and I have become really good friends over the years and, um, you know, his dad would just do about anything for him and, you know, they continue to try to find a cure. That's awesome. That's incredible. Those personal anecdotes, I feel like really bring it home too. like getting that, that, that intimate reason for why you want to help and why you want to be a part of something and help, you know, doing whatever you can to help find a cure and advance that cause. That's awesome, Mo. And hopefully something new people are uh, hearing about for the first time here. But Mo, I swear we are a soccer podcast, uh, first and foremost, and we're big soccer guys. But I wanted to ask you, Mo, just from a high level, what's your familiarity? Have you played soccer? What Do you watch soccer at all? What What is your experience like? Yeah, so growing up in Boulder, um, I did play soccer, okay. but I think it was like fifth grade, the soccer coach told me baseball or soccer. Okay. And I picked baseball. That's um, really, man. Okay. Yeah, I know, right? Especially back then. Yeah. And, and, and so, <laughs> super, yeah, I, I, I played goalie mostly, so, um, yeah, I wasn't fast enough for other positions. <laughs> But you know, hey, nothing against goalies, nothing against goalies. But I do like, like, I do have a lot of interest in soccer. I mean, I do find myself watching it on TV from time to time, especially the Premier League. But you know, I think the World Cup, I mean, was you know captivating, and, and oh, I think yeah. a lot of people that, that um, you know, normally don't watch it did. But it was, yeah, it was pretty incredible. So, you know, look, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens here in St. Louis. Um, obviously, I think you know, anytime you think about like generating business downtown, getting people downtown. Um, is just good for the city of St. Louis. So, you know, I think it's going to be a, a something that we welcome, great partnership for the city, and, you know, I wish them the very best. Yeah, I think it's huge, as you mentioned, downtown, kind of revitalizing that, and now we're going to have hopefully four, if the Battle Hawks as well, major sports teams downtown. Is there is there any connection that the Cardinals will be doing with city as far as watch parties or um, anything that you're going to do with the players or anything that they kind of thought through this summer? Um, I would imagine there'll be some things that do pop up and obviously with ballpark village, not too far away that you hope there's that sort of tie in. Um, you see it a lot with the blues anyway. Um, you certainly like from my office, you can look out and you always know if there's a blues game or not at home. Um, so, so I think that part is, is cool, but like, you know, again, anything you can do where you're getting people downtown is, is welcoming. And, uh, you know, I think the biggest thing for us is, you know, just continuing to try to work at creating a safe environment for people so fans can come down here and, and they feel good about it. Mo, another thing too, which I feel like is important in ownership and just, you know, front office, especially and being a part of the club is having that St. Louis background. I mean, and you're not technically by birth St. Louis, but you've spent you know a lot of your life here now. It's, in fact, most of your life here now, right? So, I mean, you are a St. Louis and it didn't happen like most people do, but you know, you have people like the Taylors and the, and Jim Cavanaugh on, um, you know, ownership for the club. Have you met with any of them or, or talked about, you know, anything, what they're doing or kind of just, you know, shared notes on club owner, not club ownership, but what it takes to really run a club successfully at all. You know, I've, I've mentioned to Jim, if he ever wants to connect on that, you know, to let me know, I've not connected uh, directly with the Taylor family mm -hmm. on that, but 
like, look, I'm pretty accessible. So if anybody's sort of <laughs> interested, um, you know, I think my, 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 my little advice to them would be avoid social media, especially early on. I mean, I know, you know, people are going to say a lot of nice things. There's going to be a lot of glowing stuff, but, you know, ultimately people want to know if you're winning or not. Yeah, completely understandable. And I think just probably one more additional question that we have is with everything that you have learned as being this high up in, in the front office of the Cardinals over that long period, is there any parting advice that you would have for the team? And as those guys kind of get through the ups and downs and tribulations of seasons and highs and lows, what, what kind of would you, what kind of advice would you impart? Well, I think it's like, you know, just sort of sound business advice, right? Is, is like build a process that you believe in. And then stick to it. I think a lot of times, especially you, you, you watch what happens like in the NFL and, you know, the patience to, to allow something to get going, you don't, you don't really see that. And, and I think like that, that's where mistakes happen is because it does take some time. And, you know, look at the Cincinnati Bengals, for example. I mean, there's a coach that, you know, arguably took some slower steps his first couple of years, but then ultimately – they drafted well. Now they've signed well, and the system he has in place is, is working at a you know very elite level. And I think like the, the thing you always have to remind yourself of is you, if, if you believe in a process, then believe in it. And so you know we're an organization that we are definitely process, process, process oriented. We you know we've come up with how we think about our decision tree, how we make decisions, and why. And you know fortunately for us, we have an owner that believes in that. The, the ownership group gives us the autonomy to do it. And um, with that trust, we're allowed to see it through. But I think like any new group getting into sport, you always have to remind yourself that it's not always easy and there are growing pains, but along those growing pains, you know, learn from mistakes, but ultimately believe in the people that you're entrusting to get you where you need to go. I love that. That's some good wisdom and, and hopefully some stuff that I think they're already starting to look at in terms of how they want to be successful as a franchise as they get looking at starting their first season here shortly. Well, Mo, I, they actually have their first ever real game in the MLS on your first, I think, February 25th pre, uh, preseason spring training game for the Cardinals. So uh, already exciting to see that, you know, coming up on the horizon here. But opening day also getting very close, March 30th, correct? That's right. Oh, man, it's going to be a season. But, Mo, we, we really appreciate you giving us a chunk of your time and for all you've done for the Cardinals and our history of success and, and really also for the community of St. Louis. Uh, we'll be rooting the birds on as as they you know hit the ground running, hopefully, at the end of March here. Thanks all for right. joining, John. Well, I thank you both. It was fun. And uh, hopefully you guys found a little bit insightful. And if nothing else, we'll see you at the ballpark, boys. That sounds, sounds good. good. All right. Thank thanks, you. guys.